Hi, you're listening to Remembering the Past. I'm Corey Franklin, and this is the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We don't do many poets on this show, but tonight we're going to start out with a poet because he was one of the great poets of the second half of the 20th century, Seamus Heaney. Seamus Heaney died recently at the age of 74, and he's been called by many the greatest poet of our age. He was an Irish poet in the tradition of William Butler Yeats and Samuel Beckett. Like both of them, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He won the Nobel Prize in 1995. He was a professor at Harvard, and then he became the poet in residence at Harvard. But in Ireland, where poetry is revered, he's something of a folk hero. Here's BBC 4's Matthew Bannister from The Last Word to talk about Seamus Heaney. Under my window, a clean, rasping sound, when the spade sinks into gravelly ground, my father digging. Seamus Heaney was born into a Catholic family in Northern Ireland, but lived in the Republic for most of his life. His prolific writing was garlanded with all the great poetry prizes, and he achieved a combination of literary acclaim and popularity with readers around the world. He explained how he became a poet. It was after I left Queen's University and I was teaching in Belfast, and I began to read contemporary Irish and British poetry. And I read Patrick Kavanagh's poetry, who's an Irish poet, uh, from County Monaghan, who writes very much about the rural outback, the same kind of life that I came from myself. A coarse boot nestled on the lug. The shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops, buried the bright edge deep, to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. And at the same time, I encountered the poetry of Ted Hughes, which was immensely exciting to me. And it opened... Uh, channel into not just into memory but into language i always liked for example jared manley hopkins's poetry i liked words that had a terrific rough energy to them once i carried him milk in a bottle corked sloppily with paper he straightened up to drink it then fell to right away nicking and slicing neatly heaving sods over his shoulder going down and down for the good turf and in Ted Hughes's poetry, this was poetry being written in the 1960s, I said, my goodness, you know, you're permitted to relish this. You're permitted to write about pigs lying in burrows. I always remember opening the book called Lupercal in the Belfast Public Library and said, view of a pig, and said, the pig lay in a burrow dead. I thought nobody knew about that except myself. So there was that uh, sudden access of, as the Californians would say, permission the cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of a nedge through living roots awaken in my head. But I have no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. Professor Kieran Carson is head of the Seamus Heaney Centre for Poetry at Queen's University, Belfast. I asked him how much of Heaney's life is in the work. The poetry is the life. It's a summary, I think, of how he approached life, how he thought of it. His poems about being a child are wonderful. They're the eye of a child who can see things as they are, apparently simple, but with an aura of something beyond the ordinary, that he can make the ordinary into something extraordinary and which stands there uh, uh, for all time. Her hand scuffled over the bakeboard. The reddening stove sent its plaque of heat against her, where she stood in a flowery apron by the window. Now she dusts the board with a goose's wing, now sits broad-lapped with whitened nails and measling shins. Here is a space again, the scone rising to the tick of two clocks, he was an enormous international figure, but he was quintessentially Irish too. Yeah, How important was his Irish identity to, yeah, well, to the work? I, I remember very well the first time I came across his work, 1965 or six or so, with his first book, Death of a Naturalist. It was kind of stunning because it was written from our language, an Ulster sort of language, and I think it's evident that he moves in that realm of language with joy. There are tire marks in the yard. Agnew's old lorry has all its cribs down, and Agnew, the coal man, with his Belfast accent sweet-talking my mother. 
Would you ever go to a film in Marfeld? But it's raining, and he still has half the load to deliver further on. Even in poems which are about sad events, even in poems about deaths, tragedies, especially in Northern Ireland, you still get the feeling that because he's so wrapped in the language, that something emerges from that that is a consolation of sorts. And I think that why he has become such an icon of a poet is that because he does afford us a means of understanding loss, death, pain, anxiety. And here is love, like a tinsmith scoop, sunk past its gleam, in the meal bin. Well, I'm joined in the studio now by Maurice Redden, himself a poet and editor of Poetry Review and a friend of Seamus Heaney. What sort of a family background did he come from? Well, he came, as it said there, from a nationalist family in the north of Ireland, a uh, Catholic family. He was, uh, there were nine children and Seamus was the eldest, uh, a farming family. And did that rural background infuse his work? Oh, absolutely. I think that was his, his, his omphalos, that was the centre of his world, as he, he would put it himself, the pump uh, in the yard was his omphalos. So I think that he was always, as it were, plugged in or um, relating to that. His first book, Death of a Naturalist, that was 1966, so he was uh, 27, I guess. And that was very successful, and uh, su subsequent books were very successful too. But I don't think it was, um, it was a gradual rise, a steady rise. He, he was extraordinarily uh, at ease, I think, with, uh, with himself and with fame. I mean, he was, he was uh, friends to the great and the good, to presidents and, uh, and celebrities. Uh, but uh, Seamus, I think, had, uh, had a kind of uh, natural humidity. Let, let's hear from Seamus Heaney again, reading his poem about his honeymoon trip to London, Happier Days, Underground. There we were in the vaulted tunnel running. You and your going away coat, speeding ahead. And me, me then, like a fleet god gaining upon you, before you turned to a reed or some new white flower japped with crimson. As the coat flapped wild, and button after button sprang off and fell in a trail between the underground and the Albert Hall. Honeymooning, mooning around, late for the proms. Our echoes die in that corridor. And now I come as Hansel came on the moonlit stones, retracing the path back, lifting the buttons, to end up in a draughty, lamp-lit station after the trains have gone. The wet track, bared and tensed as I am, all attention for your step following, and damned if I look back. Seamus Heaney, who's died age 74. Yeah, Matthew Bannister does a nice job on those poets. We move on now from an Irish Catholic poet to a nice Jewish girl from Cleveland, Muriel Siebert, who died recently at the age of 84, and she broke the glass ceiling on Wall Street. She was the first woman to have a seat on the New York Stock Exchange, and she became a well-known investor and philanthropist. Here is Bloomberg on Muriel Siebert, the first woman of finance. Muriel Mickey Siebert was truly an icon. We lost a trailblazer today. She was the first woman to own a seat on the New York Stock Exchange in 1967. Betty, that's a full decade than the next woman to occupy a seat. Again, she was a pioneer in the discount brokerage industry. She was the first woman superintendent of the New York State banking system. And though she donated millions of dollars to helping women in finance, she was very outspoken in saying, it is too soon, Betty, for women to declare victory as it comes to their position on Wall Street. Well, that's true. She was quite outspoken. And here she tells her story and gives some of her opinions in an interview. I was great at math. I can look at a page of numbers and they light up and tell me a story. Growing up, I was visiting New York and I visited the New York Stock Exchange. We were on the balcony looking down at the floor. I said, you know, this looks exciting. Maybe if I come to New York, I'll get a job on Wall Street. And I came with a used car and $500. I was an analyst on a salary, but at the same time, these institutions were giving me orders. And I had a following, but I got about 60% of what the men got. I asked one of my clients, what large firm 
could I go to where I'll be paid equally? And he said, don't be ridiculous. You won't. Buy a seat. Work for yourself. My application turned the street upside down. And they said, we've never had a woman apply. Nobody would dare to apply. I was creating something no one had ever done before. Some of the men thought a woman had no place on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And yet there were men who bent over backwards because they saw I was serious and I was doing the job and I wasn't there to play around. I had to have two languages. If I was dealing with the trader, every other word had to be a four-letter word. So I learned that language and still use it. The toughest trader said to me, I really enjoy when I call you and give you an order. And I go home at night and I tell my daughter and my wife, we were opening doors and the doors have opened and opened dramatically. Women are coming up very fast in running money. When I was growing up, money was not a proper subject for ladies. They don't talk that way today. There are more and more women trading stocks now. And they're good, but they do hold their stocks longer. They're not in and out. I think women are more patient. Where men, I think, have a little more, uh, what shall I say, drive for the quick profit. And they'll often make the dime, but they'll leave a quarter behind. Muriel Siebert, as I said, she did a lot of philanthropic work. And through her philanthropic work and her financial acumen, she broke new paths for women. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tapps. And in closing tonight, we're going to use a song about succeeding in Manhattan through your self-confidence. It's not a woman, it's a man, but I think it's a good tribute to Muriel Siebert. It's a great song sung by Robert Morse from Frank Lesser's How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. I believe in you. You have the cool, clear eyes of a seeker of wisdom and truth. Yet there's that up turn chin and the grin of impetuous youth. I believe in you.